Thank you. Great song. If your Bibles, let's open to Proverbs chapter 22. If you need a handout, would you raise your hand and the usher will come to hand you one, if you would, if you need one. Tonight as we continue in our series on the top 10 ways to ruin your children. Been there a few weeks now, six weeks now. And we'll continue on and wrap up here in just a few weeks here as we're on number six this week, Proverbs chapter 22. And don't forget, this Sunday morning at First Baptist Church is Open House Sunday. Open House Sunday here. Make sure you're out. Had a great time out last night. And I know that on the bus, at least three people were saved out soul winning on that bus. As we invite folks uh, to come on Sunday, 11 o'clock a.m. for our morning service. Of course, 10 o'clock for Sunday school. Then we'll have an afternoon service as well. So we're looking forward to going soul winning tomorrow. Tomorrow night at 3.30 if you want to go with um, a, a group of us. If you have a different time you want to go out, that's all right. You'll find in the lobby, you'll find some tables with maps and the pamphlets and the uh, tracks. So you can grab those, grab a map, and go out on your own time as well. Well, Proverbs chapter 22. Anyone else need a handout? Just raise that hand, wave down. Brother Joe's over here, and he'll help you. Make him run back and forth. So don't do it all at once, all right? Make him go back and forth, because, and uh, he likes that. He likes that. And so no, thank you, Brother Joe, for doing that. Proverbs chapter 22 in, in our Bibles, and in our handout sheet as well, says this. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have an expectation, parents, to make sure that we're training our children in the right way, the way that is the, the Lord's way. And there are four principles we've started every week with, and we'll again start with those four principles. You'll see them on the top of your handout, and I will repeat them every single week. to Make sure we remember them. Number one, very few people are trying to ruin their children. Very few people are trying to ruin them, but some are. But some are, but very few are trying. Very few are trying. I believe I have met one or two. This church is filled with, with a, a great parents, though I think we can always learn to improve. Amen. Number two, we are all going to make mistakes. If you have a pen, underline that, highlight it, circle it, tear it out, put it, you know, and uh, pin it to your arm or to your hand. We are all going to make mistakes, every single person. And maybe uh, in this you're like, oh boy, I've made a whole mess of mistakes. Well, often in our life, after we make mistakes, the Bible brings truth, does it not? All right, when the Bible brings truth, what are we supposed to do? Respond to it. All right, and that is number three. We must realize our incorrect tendencies, actions, and attitudes and make corrections. You say, well, what if my child's already out of the house? Well, you know what? You can still be a good godly parent. Maybe not all these things will apply to you in that spot, but, but there are times in our life we'll have revealed truth from God's word, look back and say, oh boy, I've been blowing it for, for 10 years. Right? Someone gets saved and they're maybe 40 when they get saved or 50 when they get saved. They said, man, I live 50 years apart from God. Well, they shouldn't quit, right? They, they shouldn't be defeated. They said, you know what? Now I can move forward. And with the grace of God, do the best job I can today with his grace and his power. So in this, we, I think we can all learn some things. And last, the last principle there, kind of our foundation for this series, God brings practical truth and help from Scripture to our parenting. I hope, parents, that the reason you do the things you do is found right here in God's Word. If not, you're not using God's wisdom. Not, you, now, you will not find in this Bible what time your kids ought to go to bed. The Bible does not say kids must go to bed at 8.30 or 7.30 or when mom's tired. Well, that's a great idea, right? Mom and dad are tired. Bedtime, kids. It's 4.30 in the afternoon. That's right, it is. But the Bible brings instruction. And I believe, and I believe even inside of bedtime brings some principles. We're going to look at that tonight if we can. All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for this time that we have. Lord, help me as I bring you these truths and I pray that you'd help me to speak these things clearly. Lord, help our hearts to be open and maybe learn some things. Would you be help tonight to us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, number six on your hand out there, if you want to ruin your kids, then let your kids live an unrestricted life. You could also, if you wanted to use a Bible word there, we'll look at a few minutes, unrestrained. Unrestricted, unrestrained if you want to ruin your kids, just let them do anything that they want to do. What we're going to talk about tonight is rules. Rules. 
Do you know that foundationally, the world was created on rules? When God created the world, there were certain rules that he put into place, right, that are unable to be broken. Right? Yes or no? You understand this, right? Things like we are all tending uh, toward breaking apart, not getting better. We're not tending toward evolution. Not the way that God made the world. God put certain rules into place. Creation is set up on rules as well. And our houses ought to have some rules. Say, aha, I knew it. Teenagers are like, all right, mom and dad, time to go home. All right, sermon's done. Get out of here. I don't want to hear this. Every place you go, there are going to be rules and authority in life. We cannot live but not understand that there are rules. It's the way it is. The way it is. God set even our bodies up with certain ways that our bodies are supposed to run. Our bodies do not run on gasoline. If you drink gasoline over and over again, your body will stop running. Now, you can say, I don't like that rule. I will reject that rule. But you will find out that that rule will be true. Yes? Our bodies barely run on donuts. We push the limits on that. Our bodies were obviously made to run on coffee. Thank you. A few amens or a few spiritual people here. No, I, I just, I kid. A few things that happens inside these unrestricted life. One we find is sometimes at first blank there, homes with no boundaries. No boundaries. Children can do whatever they want to do. Now lastly, we looked at the idea that what happens when we let our kids run their own lives. Number five and six, two principles, tie very closely together but slightly different in application and, uh, in, in, and as we uh, implement them. No boundaries in these homes. Or very little boundaries in these homes. Just be here by 11 o'clock at night. Beyond that, whatever happens, happens. We live in a society where many homes are run with very little or no boundaries. You will see people all around us, parents or raising children, with very little or no boundaries. They get to do whatever they feel, whatever they want to do. And nothing will stop them. There's also, in these homes, no guidance. No guidance. Number three, they're the blank, no restrictions. Now, as I approached this particular lesson, I decided to look up some secular ideas and secular thoughts, apart from the Bible. And I just Googled this. Google this little phrase, should our homes or should parents make rules for children? Should our homes have rules? I was just curious what I would find. Wouldn't you know it, Google did not fail me again. It instantly popped up with thousands, millions of hits. Instantly. I mean, barely, barely a half a second went by and my page was full of results. You know, sometimes you do a search and it's like just spin in there, right? No, no, not, not the case. And I begin to flip through some articles. Am I nuts? Or is it just a Bible thing, just a Christian thing? Or do other unsafe people also recognize the need for restrictions in homes? Now, you would think from what you hear most of the time that the majority of data would say, no, no restrictions in homes. You would think that's what I thought I would get, where, where I'd just get page after page of a, of a psychology and um, just these answers. You know what? No, don't restrict your children. Let them do what they want to do. Not quite like that, but in some psycho jargon. Lo and behold, I found things like this. Here's why our kids need rules. So, wow. I couldn't help resist but click. Rules give much-needed boundaries to kids. My kids thrive when there are rules there. Rules keep my kids safe. Another article, nine rules parents should enforce at home. Not a Christian website, not an ounce of Bible at all in it, but nine, I said, man, nine rules. Boy, you're getting to a pretty strict home with this, but nine rules 
parents should enforce at home, suggested by therapists, and meant for both you and your kids. Now the one, the only two rules of family needs. Only two rules. Now, what do you think they said for the only two rules that a family would need? I had to read this one. I said, okay, now, now I, I have to know. Like, what would they say? Only two rules. Two rules that they said, this other article, not, not biblical, not Christian, not an ounce of Bible on the entire web site that I could find. They said the two rules that a family needs are number one, be kind to each other. I said, boy, I've read that before somewhere. I've read that before somewhere, and it wasn't online. My goodness. Second rule, first time listening. Let me, let me break that down for you. They expected their children to do what they said the first time they asked. Well, what do you so, And not, not an ounce of Bible. I mean, this is no Bible verse. No, it, was, it wasn't a pastor. It wasn't a Christian counselor. It wasn't a Christian. Uh, any, it, it wasn't a campsite. It was just a secular, unsaved website on how p- homes should operate. And they said that kids ought to listen the first time. And they said, these two rules you have to have in your home. And then they said, we have lots of other rules in our homes as well. They said, we can't use the word stupid in our home. I said, my goodness, what kind of home is this, all right? Some of you have the same type of home, right? And they said, they can't, no, no pushing and no, and no shoving. And, and uh, they said, these are the only two rules you need. And I, I was, and then I found this article, The Importance of Setting Limits for Children. This was in the U.S. News and a World Report article. Not that uh, it's a Christian website again. And they made some points about what parents feel like when they make rules. So understand as we look at this concept, this is not just me in one sense saying, boy, as a pastor, as a dad of young kids, you ought to have some rules. Other people who are not saved also recognize the fact, because it is truth, that kids need restrictions and guidelines in their lives. If they had just read the Bible, they could have figured that out. If they just look at the Bible, we know that. But sometimes, Christian parents, we struggle with this. Some Christian parents struggle with with bringing the rules and the right kind of rules or the right attitude and rules into the home. There's some deceptive thoughts we'll look at tonight. If you would with me on your your handout there, deceptive thoughts. The first blank there, there's the thought of laziness. Now, I'm going to use some pretty bold, four bold words here, kind of ex- explain them why I'm using these bold words. Laziness is a bold word to, to call a parent lazy. It's a very bold word, is it not? Right, but let's look at what this thought says and does. The, the thought that says, well, this is above my head. I just don't want to mess with it. That equals laziness. Or, or this kind of thought, I'm tired. I'm tired. It's a lazy parenting style. I am sick of the battles. A little phrase for you there. Laziness is not a parenting technique. It's a cop-out. All right, don't miss that blank. Laziness is not a parenting technique. But many parents employ laziness as a technique. I'm tired today, I had a long day at work, I fought this same battle over and 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 over. Maybe you have stubborn kids like my kids are stubborn. You know what, I just don't feel like fighting it again. Laziness. If we're not careful, then our kids will have unrestricted, unrestrained child-rearing experience life because ultimately we're just being lazy. Or this one, I'm going to show you mercy this time. And so I'm going to give you one more chance. It's not mercy. Now we can show mercy. The Bible says that mercy rejoiceth against judgment. See, the point of mercy, the mercy in Scripture, as I find, the point of mercy is that it is responded to. When mercy was not responded to, judgment always follows. The point of mercy is response. So listen, I will withhold this particular judgment, this penalty that should 
be enacted that should take place. I am showing you mercy because I believe you're going to respond to this. My time as principal, many times I could show mercy to the correct response. Sometimes, after time, the response was not what it's supposed to be, and judgment always had to follow. God does the same thing. God shows mercy. If mercy is not responded to, judgment always follows. The greatest mercy ever shown was Jesus Christ dying on the cross, was it not? Greatest mercy must be responded to. If it's not, ultimately judgment always follows follows but parents use this mercy thing uh when really they're just being lazy you're driving down the road i'm, just, I'm gonna show you mercy i'll show you mercy no you just don't want to pull over you just don't want to pull over so don't claim it to be mercy if it's not really mercy don't misrepresent mercy laziness is one of the unfortunately uh pitfalls of unrestrained unrestricted children number two another bold word or the blank there some parents are just deceived some parents are just deceived. A little phrase there, well, my kids would never do that. <laughs> but they did. But they did. They'll use phrases like this, I wouldn't have even thought about doing that as a child. And they're probably accurate. They probably wouldn't have thought of that doing it as a child. Well, my kids, they're good kids. They're good kids. They're inherently good kids. When I was that age, well, when I was that age, I was in fill in the blank. Well, something happens over time. I hope you, something happens over time. We don't remember accurately. There's two words with two blanks on your paper. Two words. I have two words for you parents. Ready for it? Don't miss this. This will be helpful, I promise. Two words, parents. Sin, nature. All right, get that. Sin, nature. If you have children, you got a little pagan in your house. Sin, nature. I have three pagans, well, I have five pagans, my wife and I included, all right? Sin, nature. Our kids have a sin nature. We can see it when they're real young. They may not always express it or understand it fully when they're very young, but you can see it very, very young. You can see stubbornness very, very young. I still remember when Johnny was in a little walker at our first house on Airport Road. And he was trying to start moving around, and as a new parent, you're excited when they start to move, and then you realize this was a horrible idea. I liked it better I could sit them there and leave them for a while. All right, and they don't, you, they don't like you locking them in cages at this point, I guess, in life, but who knew? But um, he's running around his little walker, and uh, Christmas decorations were out. My wife had, I think it was like a red ribbon, honey, was it red or something like that on the little ottoman there? And uh, little Johnny, we were teaching him those, the keyword no. Not a keyword, no. Like, don't touch that. And uh, he was just wheeling and moving all around, and he went to touch that thing. And uh, my wife I always said, no, Johnny, don't touch that. And he would touch it, so he said, no, don't touch that, and kind of smacked him, just a little bit smacked his hand. And as we stepped back, he looked at us, he looked at us like this, he's down here, takes his other hand, other hand, and grabs it. <laughs> While he's, look, he's making eye contact with us. I'm convinced he gets that from his mother. I'm convinced. <laughs> no, no, it definitely not, definitely from me. And really, it's in nature. Right? Why does, why does a young child at two, one and a half, two years old, understand clearly not touch that, would not use this hand, would look at a parent straight in the eye and reach? It's in nature. It's in nature. Understand, I don't want to be deceived by the sin nature. And parents, when you grew up, whatever time frame that was, whether it was the 70s, 80s, about in there. It's a different time than 2021. Different time. Different time. Sin nature. Don't be deceived. Another word there, third word down there. Some parents are unfortunately foolish. Foolish. A little phrase there I want to be the cool parent. Listen, being, being a parent is cool. It's a blessing. It's a blessing from God. Now, 
You don't have to be cool because you have no rules. You ultimately will not be cool in that regard. But I want to be the cool parent. I would call this idea also insane, irrational, and ridiculous. Doesn't work. Does not work. Doesn't. And ultimately you will not have the impact you think you're going to have. And number four, that fourth blank there is ignorance. Ignorance. Well, I'm just fine with, and the blank on my sheet and your sheet is truly blank. You can fill in the blank. Well, I don't feel, I don't see, and it's truly just ignorance. Don't miss this phrase, just because you can handle it doesn't mean your kids can. Let me give you a couple examples about this particular idea. We were driving down the road using a DVD player on our van traveling out there. We're playing the cartoon uh, known as The Incredibles. Been out for a number of years now, right? Driving down the road. And The Incredibles were about, oh boy, five, ten minutes into, the, into this particular video. Kids are in the back seat, uh, semi-comatose state. And uh, all of a sudden, my wife and I'm like, you know, we got to stop this deep thing. Now I can't see it. I'm driving down the road. I'm driving and, and happy the kids aren't screaming. This is, this is thrilling in my life. Um, but all of a sudden I'm hearing this family, these Incredibles is about these little superhero family, right? And in that, in the first part of the movie, I guess, the dad and mom are yelling at each other. And the kids are yelling at mom and dad. And I don't know about you, but that's not how a home is supposed to operate. Let me repeat that. That's not how a home is supposed to operate. Mom shouldn't yell at dad. Dad shouldn't yell at mom. And kids should not yell at mom or dad or each other. Right? You might, some of you may need to take a little note right there. They're yelling at each other. I said, honey, well, I can hear what's going on. I could watch The Incredibles, and I would watch that movie, and I would not think I should yell at Doreen. I'm not going to connect those dots. Here I am, I'm trying to be a spiritual husband, a spiritual dad. I'm not going to think because a cartoon, they're yelling at each other, to think that's how my home's going to operate. But here, my kids are in the back seat, and they are maybe two, two and a half, and somewhere in that age. They can't necessarily separate reality from fantasy. So just because I can hear people yelling and think, I'm not going to do that, that's not right, doesn't mean that they can at that age handle it. Just because you can handle it does not mean that your kids can handle it. Just because you don't see anything wrong with it doesn't mean it's unhelpful or shouldn't be removed from your children's lives. It cannot be just what I'm affected by. It's a bigger question. We have two biblical examples. They're on your page there. The example of Eli and his sons. The example of Samuel and his sons, both found in the book of 1 Samuel, about five chapters or so apart. Both sets of sons did wrong. Both did wrong. Both did not make wise choices. But one was condemned and one wasn't. Eli was condemned by God and was removed from the priesthood because of his sons. Samuel was not. You look at these two passages, I think there's a little truth here we can look at. Where the Bible says Eli and his sons, God says he's talking to Samuel. Samuel's around 12 years old here. And God says to him, for I have told him, that is Eli, that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile and he, help me, restrained them not. Eli apparently didn't restrain them, didn't restrict them. The Bible says of Samuel, says it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of the second was Abiah. And they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways. 
that were not in his father's ways. Remember Proverbs 22, 6, where we started tonight? Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way. The Bible says that Samuel's sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. I believe the Bible's teaching us here that though both sons turned the wrong way, Samuel's sons turned that way in spite of what their father had instructed and restrained. Eli's were just allowed to go wherever. And God said the greater condemnation, though both sons were, they're all both held accountable, their own choices, God said, Eli, you're accountable for not restraining and restricting your sons. See, parents, we're accountable, we're accountable, we're responsible for setting up some guidelines for our kids. Look at the correct response, please, on your page there, Proverbs 29, 17. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We need to do three ideas, have three ideas with restrictions. Number one is this. View restrictions correctly. View restrictions correctly. A little phrase there for you, they're guardrails. They do not equal or guarantee spirituality, love for God, or that our job is done. Guardrails on the highway, keep your car hopefully, from going off the road and you dying. They're normally placed at dangerous spots, right? At a bridge, where if you leave that bridge, you end up in a really bad predicament. If you hit a guardrail, your car does not bounce off like a cloud. There's still damage that takes place, all right? But hopefully, by hitting the guardrail, the restriction, the rule, all right, even though that leaves pain and and is not pleasant, it still saves someone from the destruction that comes from going off that particularly bad place. Make sense? So in our homes, these restrictions ought to be seen, first of all, as guardrails. The guardrails do not equal you're a good driver. Guardrail to guardrail does not equal, wow, you get the the good driver award. All right, you get the visit the mechanic award. All right, so guardrails do not equal spirituality. Look, my kids haven't even touched the guardrails. Wow, they're amazing. No, no, no. These are not here as a mark of spirituality or love for God. They're to save your kids from destruction and from messing up their life. So that's why sometimes we got to say no. That's why at an early age we say, kids, don't stick this into a socket. Right? Now, we're not trying to ruin their life, are we? We're trying to protect them a little bit so they don't get shocked. And as adults, all right, then we wouldn't play electricity. We get shocked at that point. I said, boy, I should have learned it when I was a kid. Three purposes of restrictions right there. Three. First one is this, to protect. Don't touch outlets. Protect. My parents had a rule growing up, don't ride with teenagers. You say, now, why did they say that? Well, I think a couple of reasons. Right? One, I think they recognize that teenagers are not the safest drivers in the world. All right, probably. Again, teenagers, many of you are going to get your license next little bit, and you get so excited, you come and tell me, hey, Pastor Hal, I got my license, and I rejoice with you on the outside. On the inside, I back my truck up a little bit deeper into my spot. Say, don't park by me. No, no, we know. And uh, probably because, uh, because teenagers can be influenced with each other. What do we tell kids? Don't run with scissors. Right? Guardrail. Why do we have the guardrails? So hopefully they don't stab themselves. I told you about it at wilderness camp or man-up camp. When my son cut himself on the hand with a knife, I bought my son's knives early on in life, much earlier than my wife would have preferred. But because we're just us boys together, she w- couldn't see me when I bought them. And so he brought the one this last year, and he brought me the knife, and I, he cut his hand, and I said, well, Johnny, here. Here's a good time for a lesson. I taught you this lesson, taught my son. You always cut toward a buddy, not your body. It's a life lesson, all right? And we took some super glue, glued it right up, and he was good to go, you know, problem solved. And um, yeah, you know what? 
You're going to cut yourself in life. I've cut myself in life when I've cut toward myself, right? Come on, men. We've done this. We know we're not supposed to. We know to teach our sons, cut, cut towards your body, not your body. But you're like, you know what? I've got one cut. I'm twisted all around. To cut the right way, I have to get up and move around and reposition. I'll just cut this real quick just like this. And whoops, that real quick ends, to a, uh, ends up into a oh no. And uh, rules, restrictions are there to protect. There to protect. Now different parents will have different protections for their kids. We will all view things a little differently. Don't forget grace in this. And maybe in your house, um, there are certain things you won't do. Another house allows these things. You know what? You can let some grace go there. I'll give you a couple of ours for our family. Um, I'm not asking for your input or judgment. I'm just telling you what some things we do, okay? I'm not even saying you have to do all these, all right? Um, we're not big overnight, allow our kids to stay overnight at other people's houses, all right? So if you ask that, we will probably categorically tell you no. It's not because we don't like you. I don't like you, but don't like you. No, no, no. It's just um, some things we went through, and we said, you know what? We're not going to do that. It's going to be one of our protections for our kids. And some reasons, if you ever want to know those reasons, you can come talk to us. Um, most times when our kids go to a party, we will be right there with them most of the time. All right? Just what we do. And uh, if, if you don't invite our kids to the party, that's okay. That's okay. Um, but uh, just some things, again, just some things that we do, we're all going to have little things like that that I think, well, this will protect our kids in this way. Um, sometimes people say, listen, I don't want my kids to climb trees. That's fine. I'm not here to say you should or shouldn't have your kids climb trees. All right? But some people would feel that. I don't want my kids to climb trees because, you know, they could get hurt to protect them. One of the purposes of restrictions is to protect, to protect children. Number two is to prepare to prepare. We set up things in our life to help them get ready for the next phase. Help them get ready for life. It's 8 o'clock. I'm, I'm going to finish. I won't be too long. I'm going to talk about cell phones again. You mind if I do that? Thank you for letting me. I talked about it a few weeks back. Thanks, teenagers, for bringing it back up. Appreciate that. You say, Pastor, why are you against cell phones? I'm not against cell phones. All right, I run through cell phones, I upgrade cell phones, I use it all of the time. I am not for cell phones with young children and teenagers. I'll give you a couple reasons why. Um, one is that, <laughs> is that a lot of things are accessible on their cell phone. A lot of things accessible that they have no business accessing. Right? I have known people who have made connections and relationships, young people, and ran away from home to meet somebody. We're talking 15, 16 years old. They would have never met them without a cell phone. Now, some of you parents will say, well, my kids would never do that. If we could dial back to the first section, and, 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 I, and, I, and I'm trying, I don't want to pick on you. I'm just trying to, I really want to help you, all right? And again, if you let your kids have cell phones, I, I will not look down upon you. I'm not going to come and say, listen, you're, you're a filthy, rotten person. Um, our minds are, are, formu are formulating between the ages of 12 and 22. A lot of things happen right here in the mind. Chemical changes, thought processes, where thoughts go from here, linear thoughts, to huge concept thoughts. Right? Documented, you can look at these things up online, scientists, biologists, they'll tell you these things, how the minds are formed. Everyone, except for a few parents, acknowledges that cell phones are addictive. Right, also well documented. You can look it up online. Don't take my word for it. Cell phones are addictive. Now, parents, adults can also be addicted to cell phones. In my life, all right, I was introduced to a smartphone cell phone at the age of 23, 24, somewhere right in there. Their mind's pretty much already formed. That's why I am able to take my cell phone, shut it off, or chuck it out the window. All right, with very little effort or feeling attached. What is interesting is that when we introduce these devices, these concepts, these addictive substances, during those young years, 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, it increases the problems. Increases the problems. Exposure, addictive tendencies. And I put in your notes, so I, I've known this and I've, I've kind of talked about this, but I put in your notes an article that I located on healthline.com. 
I'm going to read you just one section. And you can look it up later on. One section says this. Excessive cell use among teens is so common that 33% of all 13-year-olds never turn off their phone day or night. And they go on to say this. And the younger a teen acquires a phone, the more likely they are to develop problematic use patterns. That's what Healthline says. They start the article with, everyone knows these things are addictive. Everyone knows that. Part of the reason we have restrictions is to prepare our young people. Cell phones are here to stay, and they're a great tool. Great tool. Handy. Text, staying connected with people, handy tool. But we have to prepare our children. All right? I've talked about how you give your kid a flip phone. Great. At some point, and I would maybe suggest at the earliest, maybe a, uh, a senior in high school at the earliest, you can start to introduce a way to use a cell phone correctly. All right? I would probably even move that back a little bit further. But our job is to help prepare our young people. Right? So I'm not saying burn all the cell phones in life. They're, they're going to use them. I'm going to use them. I think you can use them correctly. I'm just against when they're in sixth grade, give them a smartphone. Unrestricted. I'm just against in seventh grade when you let your kids communicate all day and all night long and forget the Bible verse in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin. I'm just against in eighth grade when they can't unplug from their phone more than a minute. I'm against in ninth grade when they're angry at mom and dad, guess where they go? Right here. I'm against in tenth grade where, you know, now we have Young boys who've been struggling with pornography for a few years. Not because of the Chromebooks in the school. Not because of the, the TV in the den, but because their cell phone that's in their bedroom all night long. Well, my kids would never do that. I would never think about that. We can have all the excuses. We're supposed to prepare our kids. Lastly, or that last purpose of restriction is to establish a pattern. Establish good habits um, and eliminate bad habits. Restrictions help those things. Very quickly, I know I, right, I'm, I'm out of time, but let me finish the blanks here. Purpose of restrictions, view restrictions correctly. Number two, place restrictions carefully. Place restrictions carefully. These are not to be taken lightly or emotionally. The two blanks there, using wisdom and with unity. Wisdom, James 1, 5, if any man lack it, let him ask of God. So you ought to pray about what you're doing in your home. Looking wisdom from God should not be um, just whatever happens or how I feel today. Unity. Dad and mom should be on the same page. Dad and mom should be on the same page. You say, well, Pastor, what if we're not on the same page? Then work really hard to get on the same page. Work really hard to get on the same page. Unity. Very, very important. And lastly tonight, the last blank there, or the last section, enforce restrictions consistently. If you have a rule, enforce the rule. If you have a rule, enforce the rule. Second blank there, don't rule by emotion. I'm happy today. Everything goes. I'm stressed out today. Nothing goes. Kids become bitter and angry with an emotional turmoil like that. Well, we got through just barely, just barely. And I uh, wish I could take a little more time on that, but I appreciate you being here. Last phrase there, I desire to raise my kids with proper restrictions and guidelines to help them, to help equip them for future service for the Lord. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening so well tonight.